I do a lot of origami. Much, much more than anyone else I know. This isn't a secret either. Lots of people who have seen me in class or in the halls probably only know me as the origami guy. And there's a reason for this. I'm constantly making origami. On the bus, in my house, while being told to pay attention, whenever. I'd even be doing some right now if it wasn't for this thing. This borderline obsession with paper folding has resulted in the creation of over 2,000 pieces last school year, with my handiwork being scattered throughout many classes, halls, and even my own home. However, I wasn't born folding a paper crane. In fact, origami is a fairly recent obsession of mine. At the beginning of sophomore year, one of my classes had an interesting activity. Write a message to yourself, and then fold that message into a piece of origami. Now, I had done some origami before this in elementary school, so it had been a while, but I still remembered how to make some stuff, like a paper crane, butterfly, and even an eight-pointed ninja star, which I thought was very cool at the time. So I picked my piece, wrote my message, and sealed it away. I didn't think about what I wrote that much, but the origami stayed with me. And it just so happens that I had much more free time than I was expecting that year. <laughs> so, <laughs> between the canceled activities and technical difficulties, I thought about origami and spent some time practicing so I could make much cooler things, like a fun fidget toy and even a plain cube. Exciting, I know. Once I got good enough at these folds that I could do them naturally, I started to do them whenever I was feeling nervous or afraid. It helped to do something mundane and real to keep me grounded. And because of this, origami became a combination of a creative outlet, a mindfulness outlet, and what teachers would call a distraction. <laughs> Despite my newest vice, on the last day of school, I would create my first semi-original design, a butterfly square. By connecting traditional butterfly folds by the wings, I could create something new a very cool geometric pattern. I was far too proud of this, considering that touching, let alone picking up this design, would usually shatter it, but it was a start. I wanted to make it better over the summer, so I took the next logical step. I folded over 200 butterflies in different colors and sizes. This gave me a lot of folding practice, sure, but it also gave me a lot of material to work with to perfect my design. I quickly found out that just by adding a couple more sides, I could make it way sturdier. The only question was, how many should I add? It was easy to see I couldn't have 20, but what about six or seven? I eventually got tired of testing how fragile butterflies made of paper were, so I decided to try a slightly less frustrating approach, math. I thought back to all the geometry I was trying to forget that summer and remembered that there's a relationship between the number of sides a shape has and the sum of its internal angles. So, using this law, some algebra, and any other brain power I was somehow able to muster up during summer, I created an equation using the angles on a single butterfly model, solved for x, and found that hexagons would be the best shape for butterfly circles. And I've made them that way ever since. After solving my first real design problem, I went online, sure that I could fold anything the world could throw at me. This mindset was sadly, terribly misguided. <laughs> I quickly came across Robert J. Lang through his legendary Black Forest cuckoo clock. The first time I saw this piece, I was amazed. This was a single piece of origami made of a single rectangular piece of paper. Once I really saw it and its folding diagram that looked like some kind of abstract art, I realized origami had a much larger scale range than I initially expected. I did some research on Lang, its creator, expecting to find somebody who had dozens of years of painting, sculpting, or even composing before taking up origami. But what I found was something very different. Lang had almost 50 patents and was a very STEM-centered person with an incredible affinity for math, physics, and computer science. He had created this clock diagram in 1987, using a revolutionary new strategy for origami, applying mathematical techniques. Lang, along with other origami pioneers, created a set of rules that all origami had to follow, kind of like the laws of physics. 
Then they applied one of the most important things in math, use other people's work, preferably people who had been dead for hundreds of years. <laughs> By using ancient folds from models such as the crane and butterfly, Lang could create pieces like the clock relatively easily. Of course, relatively easily is still involved literal decades of math and art, but for a 200 plus step project, it makes sense. So after finding all this out, including its incredible step count, since I didn't have a spare week, I decided to look for a slightly tamer fold. And I found one, Opus 379, the Scorpion. Now, I started to fold this model from its crease pattern, but it was so weird with points that seemingly came out of nowhere, sometimes even requiring a coordinate system to fold correctly. I even compared it to other high-level Scorpion models after giving up, because of course, um, and saw that where other scorpions had lots of tiny pleats, this one had massive folds that went across the paper at arbitrary angles no sane person could come up with. So I did some research and figured out the reason. It wasn't made by a sane person. It was made by TreeMaker, a program that can turn stick figures into origami. Now, I've seen computers write poems, finish symphonies, and even paint but the fact that a computer could create art in a form as abstract as origami is, is incredible to me. Of course, TreeMaker, much like Opus 379, was not made by a normal person. Robert J. Lang coded TreeMaker 4.0 in 1998 on a computer that probably had less RAM than a floppy disk, and it actually worked. His secret was not using pre-made folds or the semi-algorithms used in the clock or even a fully functional AI. All it took was a little bit of artistry, a little bit of programming, and a whole lot of math. <laughs> By combining these things in just the right ways, and with some of his own added brilliance, Lang was able to create an incredible step forward in origami, computer-generated models. Now, at this point, it might seem weird to even call high-level origami an art form. With computer-generated models, algorithms, and mathematical axioms for folding, it starts to seem like a really weird form of math. But origami is still very much an art form, despite this. For example, although TreeMaker can create incredible bases, to go from a base to a finished product is something that requires a lot more work than Lang shows it to be. It's something that requires many hours of forethought and creativity, but also many hours of incredibly technical work, even for Lang. This is because a base is essentially just flaps of paper in the right places, like the building blocks for an actual model. However, another thing that shows just how ingrained art is in origami is that the vast majority of folds, from 10-step birds to 300-step krakens, are all made by humans for humans. And even though it might seem like origamis will someday run out of ideas, or at least good ones, with folds like Shuki Kato Zonoi Dragon, Sotoshi Kamiya's Ryujin, and my very own tent on a windy day. <laughs> it's obvious that amazing folds are still being created all the time. The best part is that if you want to fold mid or high level origami, you don't have to understand C or graph theory or calculus, which is good because I don't at all. All you have to know is origami. So, even if you don't have a decade of experience, a PhD in topology, and a month to kill, there's still an incredible amount of folds at all levels, from short ones like Baggy's Box to longer ones like Elias Nash's Human Base, and complexity beyond that with Chen Xiao's Black Knight. And with all this choice, it's easy to choose what you like best. Because, of course, you should make what makes you happy. Origami is something everyone can do and should. It obviously helps with hand precision, but it's also useful in our personal lives as a sort of mindfulness. I do origami whenever I feel nervous, and it helps to do something familiar and tactile, especially since all it takes is however much focus I can spare. However, origami also has potential uses in engineering, such as its prolific use in the James Webb Space Telescope where it uh, serves as an unfolding device that allows it to actually get into space, very important. Whether you're working on a 1,000-fold project or just making butterflies as a mindfulness exercise, 
Origami can help us think more dynamically, makes it just a little bit easier to navigate life's endless folds. <laughs>